Our readings today come from the translation by J.B. Phillips, who lived between 1906 and 1982. He was well known within the Church of England for his commitment to making the message of truth relevant to today's world. Philip's translation was originally written for the benefit of his youth club. It was later published more widely in response to popular demand. May these readings today bring home the message of good news as it was first heard 2,000 years ago. The first reading from Acts 9. But Saul, still breathing murderous threats against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and begged him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he should find there any followers of the way, whether men or women, he could bring them back to Jerusalem as prisoners. But on his journey, as he neared Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly blazed around him, and he fell to the ground. Then he heard a voice speaking to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? He asked. I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, was the reply. But now stand up and go into the city and there you will be told what you must do. His companions on the journey stood there speechless for they had heard the voice but could see no one. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him to Damascus. And our second reading from John 21. Later on, Jesus showed himself again to his disciples on the shore of Lake Tiberias. And he did it in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together when Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. All right, they replied, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat and during the night caught nothing at all. But just as dawn began to break, Jesus stood there on the beach, although the disciples had no idea that it was Jesus. Have you caught anything, lads? Jesus called out to them. No, they replied. Throw the net on the right side of the boat, said Jesus, and you'll have a catch. So they threw out the net and found that they were now not strong enough to pull it in because it was so full of fish. At this, the disciple, uh, sorry, at this, the disciple that Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Hearing this, Peter slipped on his clothes, for he had been naked, and plunged into the sea. The other disciples followed in the boat, for they were only about a hundred yards from the shore, dragging in the net full of fish. When they had landed, they saw that a charcoal uh, fire was burning, with a fish placed in it and some bread. Jesus said to them, "'Bring me some of the fish that you've caught.' So Simon Peter got into the boat and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 altogether. But in spite of the large number, the net was not torn. Then Jesus said to them, Come and have your breakfast. None of the disciples dared to ask him who he was. They knew it was the Lord. Jesus went and took the bread and gave it to them and gave them all fish as well. This is already the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after his resurrection from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others? Yes, Lord, he replied, you know that I am your friend. Then feed my lambs, returned Jesus. Then he said to the, for the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, returned Peter, you know that I am your friend. Then care for my sheep, replied Jesus. Then for the third time, Jesus spoke to him and said, Simon, son of John, are you my friend? 
Peter was deeply hurt because Jesus' third question to him was, Are you my friend? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I am your friend. Then feed my sheep, Jesus said to him. I tell you truly, Peter, that when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you liked. But when you are an old man, you are going to stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and take you where you do not want to go. He said this to show the kind of death by crucifixion by which Peter was going to honour God. Then Jesus said to him, You must follow me. You know, there was a hymn I used to love singing, but it disappeared from the Australian hymn book, and it certainly disappeared from Together in Song. It had beautiful melodies, a great tenor line when I used to sing tenor and a great bass line but I now sing bass but it's not in the hymn book anymore do you know what it was well I quote from an old Methodist hymn book and you will find it in the old congregational praise and in the Presbyterian hymn book but not in AHB or TIS Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Christ, the royal master, leads against the foe, forward into battle, see his banners go. Onward, Christian soldiers, marching as to war, with the cross of Jesus going on before. Do you know why it was dropped from the next two hymn books? Hey. No, oh, no, it was a great tune from uh, the Oratorio of Handel. No, great tune. No, I think... Yes, Marion? Yeah, I think so. There was a parody written on it, and um, the third stanza of this hymn goes, Like a mighty army moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where the saints have trod. We are not divided, all one body we, one in hope and doctrine, one in charity. And the parody on that, like a mighty tortoise moves the church of God. Brothers, we are treading where we've always trod. We are much divided, many bodies we, having different doctrines, but not much charity. Well, thankfully, our texts today do not reflect that kind of parody. Peter and Paul are moving on. They're not staying still. They're not staying where they were. They're not looking backwards. They're moving forward. Consider the two stories. They're wonderful stories. The story of Saul, who became Paul. He hears the voice. The others don't. He, he has this experience And the questioning of, why are you persecuting me? And he uh, finishes up as a little child. He's blinded, he can't see, he's led by the hand. And as I read this passage, I'm reminded of, of Jesus saying, to accept and become part of the kingdom, the kingdom of love, you must become as children. And here's this great proponent of the words of God against those who he saw as enemies of the church or the religion he stood for. And the passage starts, it's quite frightening, the passage in the acts of the apostles, the doings of the apostles. Still breathing breathing murderous threats. I wonder if we read in vision some time that Bob was out there breathing murderous threats against... Just a, to quite a stunning kind of reference to Paul. Breathing murderous threats. See, he was in the right. What he believed in was that his way was right and those who were enemies deserved to be cast aside. Heretics people who believed other things. His way was the only way. And so he wrote to get the letters of approval. 
So he had the authority to go about the business of rooting out those who he considered to be the enemies. But he finished up being led as a child and then became the, the great preacher, teacher, travelling many thousands of kilometres to spread the word to those who were formerly his enemies. He now accepted and welcomed the Gentiles. What a marvellous story. So rather than brothers we are treading where we've always trod, there's new life, a new way of being. Peter, he wasn't like Paul. He was a quiet fisher folk. He went about his business daily and then when the call came to follow Jesus, he did willingly. In fact, he would follow him wherever. He would never deny him until the time came by that fire when he was noted by a servant girl that he was one of them. He denied. That uh, saying comes to mind. Uh, it's when people who don't say anything that evil prospers. He didn't say anything. We don't actually need a fire to remind us that we too can stand by. We can sit down and have our latte and say, well, somebody should do something about this problem and stand by. But then this story of the seashore and having come from fishing and I think the commentators say the 153 represent the known nations of the world, 153 fish. And this is the message that Peter gained, that he was to follow Jesus out into that world that they knew at the time. Do you love me? Are you my friend? The three affirmations, feed my lambs, care for my sheep, feed my sheep. A progression of responsibility to go out into the world. This church is thinking about whether we stand and stop where we are. Brothers, we are treading where we've always trod. Or whether we're to move on. You know the old, here is the church, here is the steeple, look inside and here are the people. We are the church. We're the church that needs to decide in this era of our Lord, 2019. Where do we go from here? Do we stay where we are? Do we prop up the buildings? Do we keep steady as she goes? Or are we being called like Peter and Paul? They were called from where they were to something new. And they accepted the call. They're both call stories. Although we talk about the Paul story as a conversion story, it's really the call, a call to be the church in the world. Today I'm wearing deliberately this stole. This was woven by Palestinian refugees. They had small looms that they could, were portable and they could take with them. This is the world we live in, where people are refugees and are desperate. Do we stand by the fire so we don't know anything about them? The cross I wear is the World Council of Churches, the symbol of a ship on the rough seas. That's the world we live in and the ship we sail in. So where do we go from here? What are these call stories saying to us in this church at this time? 